You're live in broadcasting. All righty, welcome to those of you that are just streaming into our webinar. Uh, we'd like to welcome you all to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Uh, this is a webinar se series that we're putting on that is free to all that want to attend. Uh, you don't have to be an AGD member, but we encourage you to be one. Uh, we've had uh, probably 18 different webinars so far. We've got another 20 scheduled over the next few weeks uh, and who knows uh, if we don't get back to work on May 18th here in uh, Washington State we may even include some more uh, 
just a little bit of housekeeping. For those of you that are looking for CE credit, you will be receiving CE credit from the University of Washington School of Dentistry. And those CE credits will be coming in the next couple of days in your email at the email address you registered at. Please uh, save a copy of that for your records. AGD members, we will be submitting your CE automatically to the Academy of General Dentistry. And uh, that should show up on your transcript within the next two to four weeks. Uh, obviously, this is a busy time for CE and uh, everybody's operating on limited staff. Uh, this afternoon, I, I would like to just welcome you to um, um, and introduce our uh, panelists, Dr. Gary Hayamoto. Uh, he's kind of the guy that uh, put together the whole WAGD Master Track program many, many mm -hmm. years ago. So, uh, quite an architect of CE. Our executive director is Valerie Bartoli, who's been working day and night, uh, uh, weekdays, weekends, to help bring this CE to you. So thank you, Valerie. We'd like to thank all our sponsors of today's CE, which include the University of Washington School of Dentistry, CE Department, Comet USA, uh, Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, and Snohomish County uh, Dental Society. You should be receiving um, notifications from your dental society of all these upcoming webinars. If you're not, please use the QR codes that are coming by on these flyers, uh, either to register for an in individual webinar or to navigate to the www.washingtonagd.org. That's uh, our website. It will uh, have uh, the updated webinars on there. If you see a webinar that's on one of these flyers and the, the registration isn't yet on that uh, website, uh, check back. We're, we're putting these on as quick as we can, but uh, uh, we're kind of a skeleton crew here just trying to bang out as much CE for you as we can over these weeks. Uh, we get the question all the time, are these webinars being recorded? Yes, they are being recorded, and you can view those webinars at YouTube and go to Washington Academy of General Dentistry, and you should be able to see um, the, the latest webinars, uh, and those typically will be up on the website uh, within four or five hours after the completion of the webinar. It takes a little bit of time just to convert that uh, to the audio and uh, video to uh, a YouTube format. Um, with uh, today's webinar, um, uh, we uh, plan on going about an hour. There'll be some questions. Uh, and today, if you have a question for Janice Hurley, please type it into the Q&A. I know a lot of you may not be familiar with the Zoom format. Uh, play around with your Zoom application there. You'll see that you have the ability to change uh, what you're seeing on your screen from a speaker view to a gallery view. And once uh, Janice uh, starts her PowerPoint, that will come up in your main screen. But you have some flexibility in there to change your viewing uh, arrangement. You also have what are called chat. Uh, tabs and Q&A tabs. Please use the Q&A if you have a question. We will get to that Q&A at the end of the presentation. We're not going to interrupt uh, Janice during her presentation. We'll get to that at the end. Uh, please uh, feel free to share the, the links to these webinars with all your friends. You're welcome to invite your staff members, uh, dental assistants, hygienists, uh, uh, front desk can all receive CE credit. So there's no limit there. Um, and as I said before, you do not need to be an AGD member. So just waiting for a few more to sign on. Uh, we have over 800 registered for this uh, CE webinar. So, wow, it's really awesome how popular Janice is. And uh, we'd like to thank everybody that supported us. Uh, the dentists, the uh, 
presentators, uh, everybody is donating their time to bring this webinar series to you. So there's no honorariums being paid. We appreciate it in this crisis that uh, uh, people are helping out and maybe taking our minds off what's going on with uh, PPP loans and the rest of it. So again, welcome everybody to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE webinar series. Uh, my name's Dr. Tim Hast. Uh, you're joined by our panelists, Dr. Gary Hayamoto and our executive director, Valerie Bartoli. Today's special guest is Janice Hurley, and we'll get to her bio here in just a second. I just wanna thank again, the University of Washington School of Dentistry Continuing Education Department that's providing CE for these webinars. We'd like to thank Comet USA, Patterson Dental, Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, and Snohomish County Dental Society, as well as the University of Washington School of Dentistry student chapter. Uh, for young dentist students out there, keep in mind we have our Crown Preparation 101 course coming up in August there. Right now, uh, we've rescheduled that a uh, couple of times, so hopefully that'll go. Uh, for those of you that have missed any of our webinars or want to share Janice Hurley's uh, webinar, please go to YouTube. Uh, uh, the webinar should be up in the next four or five hours. And remember, after this webinar at 2.30 Pacific, we have Dr. Tazir Suleiman, and he's going to be speaking on bleaching. He's going to take an academic approach to 30 years of what we know about bleaching. Uh, it looks like uh, our webinar is uh, pretty well filled up, so uh, we will get rolling here. I... Uh, want to take just this time to introduce uh, Janice Hurley. Janice Hurley is dentistry's image expert. Attendees to her courses have consistently described her as dynamic and impactful. She has been honored for more than 10 years as one of the top speakers in dentistry by Dentistry Today, the expert on professional presence and personal branding in today's dental arena. She is emphatic that we all benefit from self-reflection and improved self-awareness. A noted authority on treatment pre presentation and effective in-office systems, Janice consults and coaches hands-on to help every office accurately portray their brand. Dental hygiene schools use her written protocol standards for both image and effective communication. She is a guest instructor at Midwestern Medical School of Dentistry and received a Lifetime Achievement Award this year from AADOM for her impact on those that serve in the dental world. Her recent book, Dental Image Branding, is making a strong impact on patient care and treatment acceptance. After earning her degree in organizing, organizational behavior from the University of San Francisco, Janice has invested more than 25 years of experience as a dental consultant, helping her clients gain higher treatment acceptance and attract higher quality patients. As an author and speaker on what it takes to project professional excellence and confidence so others feel it instantly, her goal is for everyone to use their personal energy for professional success. She's passionate about photography, dentistry, and CrossFit. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Janice Hurley. Welcome. Thank you so much, thank you so much. So uh, Timmy and I were talking a little bit ahead of time and I mentioned that I liked CrossFit and he said, ah, uh, CrossFitters are like triathletes. And I said, how is that? And he said, you always know that they're a triathlete because they tell you right away. So yes, my CrossFit friends think I talk too much about dentistry and my dental friends think I talk too much about CrossFit. So anyway, so I am um, honored and uh, very happy to be here today when I was asked to speak. Um, I asked if I could talk about what I thought was the most impactful and pertinent aspect to our dental community. Because if you think about it, right, we, we all belong to a club in this dental world that we really didn't ask to be included in, right? That means that our life has changed, uh, our business has changed. And I wanna talk about resiliency. So being resilient means that you come through to the other side. The idea is you're trying to get through this as unscathed as possible. 
Um, and Winston Churchill, I think, was a little bit too optimistic when he said that um, success was moving from failure to failure with enthusiasm. So I don't know how many of us are enthusiastic about this, but we do know that this too shall pass. So when I first designed this, I wrote it for the dentists, just specifically the business owners, because um, the success of the practice um, ends up affecting every single team member. But when we got requests for hygienists and other team members, then we opened it up, knowing that you're part of this family of success and you're personally impacted, but you're professionally impacted. And the synergism is going to be um, critical when things go back to so-called as usual, right? So I I'd like to tell you that um, I don't know your story. I don't know exactly how you've been impacted. I don't know exactly how you're responding. Um, but what I do know from experience is you will be affected um, to a lesser or higher degree based on if you have successfully been through stress before. So if you've been through hard times, you've been through stress, you've been through challenges, you've been through the loss of a home, a loss of a marriage, um, loss of relationships, um, business loans gone bad, et cetera. The more you've actually experienced in the past and been able to successfully come through on the other side will allow you to remain just a tad more calm. Um, the second aspect that affects you is you're more stressed out based on the number of people that are dependent on you. So you could be the breadwinner in the house or you could be the second income and people really need you to be able to be forthcoming with that. Or maybe you're the business owner and you have eight, 10, 25, 30 employees that you know were impacted with furloughs, et cetera. So that impacts you. And the third thing it will impact you uh, in all of this is just how connected emotionally you are to the identity of being a dentist or being a hygienist or um, going to work every day. So we're actually vulnerable to whatever our value system is. So if it's really critical to you that you always pay your bills on time, you could be more negatively impacted right now if you look at for the first time, not be able to pay that credit card in full. So there's all different aspects. Um, but when I wrote this program, I wrote it with um, great love, great compassion for all the team members that I'm associated with as a practice management consultant every day. So I'm going to share the screen now and we're going to go to the PowerPoint. And I'm going to, let's see, I'm gonna, Hide. Nope, I didn't mean to hide you. Okay, I have to unhide them. Oh, well, it's okay for right now, I think. Let's see. Uh, let's see. This is why they don't let us be in control. Show video panel. Okay. All right. So uh, this is about moving forward through the times. Who you see right here is a long time client and friend, uh, Donna Frank. They have a beautiful practice in Bakersfield, California. We've been together probably 25, 26 years. And they were on the brink of selling their practice right before all this happened. There's their beautiful assistant, Jill, who's a new mother to her uh, second child. So each of us is different, but we're the same. Each of us has been impacted, but it's going to be different. So my time with you in the next 50 minutes is to give you very specifics as to what you can do or you can help your team members do as we move forward. So sometimes we feel right now, like every day is a bad hair day, right? It's like, oh my God, I don't know if it's Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, we don't keep track. We don't have as much of a routine. So this can feel a little disoriented. Sometimes we're just exhausted from homeschooling and having our kids at home and having the kids ask the same question over and over. Or maybe it's our spouse that asks the same question over and over. I remember when my daughter, Signe, she's my second child, um, she was having her third, and I went to visit to help out with the family, you know, cook meals and 
do a little laundry and so forth. And I asked her husband where the vacuum cleaner was. And he had to say, quite honestly, I don't know. And so some of you are going through those dynamics of you're sharing household chores, you're sharing responsibilities, kids haven't really an understanding as to what's going on, but lots of changes. So here's some changes that I could ex you can expect from me. So the picture up to the left, that's a gray haired woman. And that's about what I'm going to be by the time I get to emerge from all of this. And um, when we first right, were sequestered, the question was put out there on Facebook. So who is the first person you want to see when you get back out and things are back to normal? And I wrote, oh, my grandchildren, my grandchildren. I'd like to change my answer. I would like to see Eduardo, my hairstylist, because I am not going to be a blonde much longer. And then those pictures on the right hand side, that's me three years ago, all excited about wearing high heels and going to speak at uh, the American Academy of uh, Cosmetic Dentists. And then this is me yesterday morning. Yep. No, this is me this morning, actually. I am in tennis shoes. My dog is expecting me to go for a walk. But some days I've been caught out there with uh, mismatched socks and some sandals. So lots of things changing. And forget life work balance, right? We had all been working on that before. And now what we'd really like to do is just be able to go back to work. When I thought about writing this program and suggestions and ideas, I wanted to include and think about all those people that I've come into contact over the years, people I've had as clients, people I've spoken with, people that have been meeting planners or um, just friends, people that I've gotten to know. And so the rest of this time is truly in honor of you. So we can feel like we're in this club and that it's, you know, the center circle is might be our team. And then there's the family outside of that. And then there's the whole big, huge world that is affected. But oftentimes when it comes to making the best out of a tough situation, you might have to think about what's best for you. And it's going to be different for each person, but there's actually a science to resilience. There is a science to resilience. So we work hard putting on a happy face because everybody says that's the best thing to do, but many of us back behind the scenes have moments of depression, self-doubt, and anxiety. And that is unfortunately the norm. One of the things we want to do during this time is to give ourselves grace and give others grace. So during this time, when we first got word and I first found out that the five meetings I was gonna give at Hinman and the, going to see my clients um, in North Carolina or speak at uh, an oral surgery group, all of that just quickly dissolved. My initial reaction definitely was some depression. And the depression came from experience, unfortunately, of having lived through something very similar, but not to this magnitude, and knowing the domino effect is coming. Then later, a little depression set in for me when I watched my calendar for the year be empty. And what I recognized quickly was the money was hard, the hard, but there's not going to be the money. But most of all, what was hard was not having interesting work. So many of us, love interesting work. So sometimes this is the reality of really what's going on at home, right? We're putting on a happy face in, in front for everybody, but we have children that are confused. We have played the same uh, video game over and over, or we've uh, read the same book over and over, or we're exhausted just trying to keep up. Everybody is different. So I became an authority on um, becoming better at getting through tough times, not because I chose to, but it initially uh, came to me. So I have probably read 35, 40 books that have to do with resiliency, how to be stronger, get through to the other side. And when I say stronger, I don't just mean CrossFit strong. You know, CrossFit, one of the sayings is embrace the suck. That means when it gets really hard and you've got uh, five more rounds to do, it doesn't matter how out of breath you are. But that's not the science always of becoming resilient. 
one of the most important books that I read was uh, the book called, right there off to the left called Why We Sleep. I purchased that book, read it through twice, sent it to um, three out of my four kids because it was life changing as to how important sleep was. So one of those things that you want to make sure you're right on schedule with is sleep, sleep, sleep. So I unexpectedly became a single parent when my children were six, four, three, and two years of age. This is not a photo of them then because this is a photo two years later because if any of you have been through tough times, you don't take pictures during that time. And I didn't, I didn't take pictures at all for two years, which is probably one of the reasons I'm so excited about photography now. And I would normally not share anything personal about myself because that's just not really the way I function, except I need you to know that I too have been through tough times and come out on the other side. So I found out my home was to be foreclosed on. This is uh, years ago, 1985, nobody had their house foreclosed on them. It wasn't in style. And I was the sole provider for these children. And I felt the responsibility to make sure they had straight white teeth eventually and a college education. And you push through, you figure out how to be tougher, stronger, put one foot in front of the other and success, right? Those kids are all grown up. There is Signe, pregnant, I think with her fifth child and um, happy ending, right? Happy, happy ending. So you learn a lot of lessons along the way. Another time happened in uh, 2007. I, children were all gone, graduated, married off. And um, I myself became married later. And in living in Scottsdale, Arizona, my husband was a um, land developer. And so three years previous, 2004, took on a $56 million loan uh, with two other building partners. And in 2007, when the uh, loan was due and there was the uh, building crisis, then that loan was called in. and. Um, my husband had worked on this project for three years, was emotionally distraught, not able to handle the fact that we were probably looking at bankruptcy. So I'm once again out there trying to do something I know nothing about, finding a bankruptcy lawyer, talking through all the things that you would need to do or not do to come through on the other side. So didn't have to file bankruptcy because other steps took place, but been there, done that, and know that right now, the most important thing is to know that this too shall pass. But in going through both of those, I learned some very specifics on what it took to come through to the other side. So one of the things that you want to do and doesn't cost any money is to enjoy art, art, art. You could go online right now and there are courses that your kids could take. So art, being around beautiful things, ends up being soothing, Soothing, soothing. Music, beautiful music. I love to listen to music. And depending on my mood or what mood I need to be in will change my music. One of the nicest things I remember my kids telling me was that when they think about growing up with me, they remember dancing, dancing with the car doors open and dancing on the driveway. That's pretty cool. Didn't cost any money. The other thing is to make sure you find movies that make you laugh. I am a big fan of Robin Williams and many of these movies that he's done make me laugh, but mostly they're about compassion, right? Compassion. And The Fisher King, specifically, as well as Patch Adams, made me cry. And I want you to know that actually crying right now is okay. In fact, you want to welcome it, get it done with, and sometimes you need to move on. During this time of being sequestered, many of my friends have done beautiful things like mailing me books, right? Mailing me handwritten cards. So I'm going to tell you something that seems like it's a nice thing to do for someone, but I want to point out that you're doing it for them is also a gift to you. So what you're looking at on the right-hand side of the screen is a letter handwritten by my 15 year old granddaughter and then a Christmas card down at the bottom made by my seven year old granddaughter. And what I want to tell you is 
one of the things I'm the most proud of is that my grandchildren are happy kids. And one of the reasons they're happy is their parents have taught them to give to others, to write thank yous. And what happens is I, as the receiver, enjoy that beautiful experience. But I want to tell you that they, from a source of pride, doing something that maybe they didn't think of at first, but their parents did, they're happier because of it. This Easter, my 90-year-old shut-in mom, who we sequestered away, of course, because of her age, um, she received homemade um, uh, Easter cards from 10 of her great-great-grandchildren, you know, 10 of my grandchildren. And though she enjoyed it immensely, I promise you those kids have higher self-confidence and more pride because they did the work. So the two most... Um, freezing negative aspects of assuming when you go through tough times is any sort of shame. If you feel shame comparing yourself to others or shame because you thought you should have done something differently, or if you ever at any time feel stuck, you are actually never stuck. You need to just do the next right thing, whatever that might be. So the utilization of your time is critical. So everything in life can be divided into two categories. You either have control or you don't have control, right? You know that, I know that. And what happens is you decide where you're gonna spend your time or where you're not gonna spend your time. No control, spend no time. How would you describe those people that do that? Those are the wise people. Those are the smart people. The equalizer is we each have 24 hours in a day, that's it. Same amount of time, it's always how we spend it. Now the second one, we have no control, but we spend time. No control, spend time. How would you describe those people? Wasting their time. They're usually trying to change others. We're usually try trying to change maybe laws or systems that we at this point have no control over. Um, I'm a big fan of letting them figure out uh, what our PPE needs to be, um, both from OSHA and CDC, but until then, I'm going to focus on something else. And then there's the have control and you spend time. What happens to those people? Those are the successful people. And last, I have control, but I spend no time. That's when you envy other people. You look at someone else and don't recognize how much time they put in to make that happen. So when I do courses and I work on confidence within the dental practice, I ask people to outline their day and the black spots would have to do with every 10 minute increment. So just like the way we schedule, I wanted them to think about their, their day. And if the white spots were all about unneutral in terms of being happy or not happy, but during my day, those are the black areas. These are the times that I'm frustrated. This is when I think I'm frustrated because the patient didn't show up or I have too many new patients for the day or my doctor didn't show up for the morning huddle on time. If you were to outline your day, how many times is it black and how many times is it neutral? And then how many times is it happy? The rest of the things I'm gonna go over with you right now that I'm gonna suggest you implement and do within your life are to help you to have your day today and when you return to be as happy as possible. Isn't that really the goal? So money will not make us happy. Health sometimes comes and goes, but happiness is a choice. I'm happy when I decide to be. So right now, for some of you in some areas of your life, not all your life maybe, but some areas of your life, it might just feel like a struggle that you're pushing against the hardest of odds. And in some areas, you are. Harvard Business Review came out with the fact that what you're feeling right now is actually grief. It's real. Like the loss of a child, the loss of our income, the loss of our identity, the loss of stability, the loss of knowing for sure what we're going to do next week, next month, is experienced as grief. So there's the five stages of grief that are outlined before for us, right? So denial, anger, bargaining, 
depression. I went quickly to depression at first because I knew what was coming. I, in living through 2007 and the housing crisis, I knew how much people's lack of stability with their jobs affected how much money they spent on dentistry and that there would be a rippling effect. And then it's down to denial, right? This isn't really gonna happen. They really can't tell me what I can or cannot do. Uh, I think most of Texas is still feeling that, right? And then what Harvard Business Review said, the sixth one was, it's acceptance. That's when we finally ask ourselves, okay, now what? Now what do we do? So I'm gonna talk about some of my clients. You'll see them throughout these photos. So this is prosthodontist, Dr. Craman Wiltz from Huntsville, Alabama. An amazing, amazing man. Father of six kids, new father to uh, two twins right there. Are they beautiful or what? So a fantastic man who has worked incredibly hard and somebody that um, I respect and enjoy. And he's got his own challenges with his uh, practice. And one of the other challenges is his wife, his wife, his beautiful wife, is also a dentist. So two dentists in the household, two challenges. So he's got his practice life, and then he's got his personal life to take care of, right? So we are all wanting to protect our family and having been through this before um, with young children. The reason I uh, studied resilience was I didn't do it perfectly the first time. I, far from it, I made many mistakes. And in studying it, I quickly learned that our children will do as well as we do. So the words that we use, the attitude that we take, the outlook that we have, the way we frame what is happening to us will strongly affect the happiness of your kids and anyone else that you're around. So here's some words not to use. I'm going to move that away over there if I can. So words to avoid, and I don't make these up. I just am reporting from the studies. This one particularly came from um, Yale. Words to avoid, never. It's never going to be like it used to. I'm forever going to worry about my accounts receivable. <sighs> the patients always no show at the worst times. And then here's two that I added. These aren't scientific. These are uh, my additions from what I've learned. I think we should avoid the word lucky. You're not lucky, I'm not lucky. You do the work at the right time, leaning forward when you're supposed to, and then the good results come because of that. Move this back up here. Now this saying, you're going to be as successful as you are happy is actually the opposite of what most of us are taught, right? Most of us are, taught or think or believe that when I'm successful, then I'll be happy. And I'm going to tell you, the moment you embrace being happy first, you get to enjoy what's available to you and other people around you will enjoy being around you. So I studied Dr. Lucy Hone. She had the um, tragedy of losing a child. Plus she was already had her doctorate in um, resilience. And so here are three things that she identified were very specific to people that survived. So resilient individuals, they don't ask why. They don't ask why me. They know that life is hard. They know that stuff happens, right? And they end up being more resilient because they don't spend their energy on that. Two, they're very careful about what they look at or spend time on. I have a really good friend, um, Kate Williford. She's a large CPA firm and her clients are dentists, um, over 250 dentists that she's a CPA for. So she listens to the news because she constantly has to know what's going on um, in, in, in the legislatively. But she also can get depressed with what's going on. I don't own a TV, I don't listen to a TV. Um, if I want to be in a better mood, I actually signed up for a Frank Spear course and, and watched uh, that on terms of implants and what's the optimal age 
to place an implant, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to do the things that make you happy. Watching the news is not it for me. Number three is what I'm doing right now in this moment in time, helping or harming me. Is it helping me or is it harming me? So there are three things that you absolutely can take care of that cost, don't cost a dime right now that matter for you and your health and sleep first and foremost, number one. Two, get some exercise of any kind, move something around, take a really brisk walk, move a kettlebell around. Um, it doesn't cost any money to exercise right now. There are enough body weight exercises, uh, burpees, push-ups, sit-ups, all of that. There's no excuse anymore. We can't say it's because we didn't have time. And the third thing that's critical in taking care of yourself, right, is that you wanna set up a routine in your life. You wanna give yourself at least three things that no matter what you do, because at the end of the day, you can tell yourself, I did that. So for me, it's making the bed. And the second one is I clean up my kitchen counter and I make it all sparkly and clean before I go to bed at night. So when I get up in the morning, it's shining and looks good. And the third thing that I do is I call my mom. I call my mom every day or I write my mom every day because I want her to know that she's loved. She's loved. And be really careful about what you eat. Vegetables, if it's green, if it's colorful, if it's fruit, if it's not packaged, it's your friend. So every day, every moment in time, if we want to get past this in the best condition possible, we have to pay attention. These are four beautiful hygienists from Dr. Devaney's office in um, North Carolina. And these are amazing, amazing women. And they are going to have to come up with some universal steps and standards to make sure that they're healthy and their patients are healthy. And that is important that you are answering the patient's questions, answering your own fears, and as a team, you're addressing this together. So hygienists are smart, smart individuals, and as a team, you wanna look at what are your precautionary steps going to be. So here's a different circle. This circle, I want you to think about in terms of you might be on that outside ring and there are individuals in the center ring that are maybe financially even worse off than you. There are people in the outside ring that are financially better off than you, than you. And that's always going to be the case. There's always going to be somebody better off or less, right? So here's my circle. But let's pretend that the, here's the people that I want to make sure to take care of because I believe at this point in time th that if they didn't get paid monthly, what I normally would pay them, that they would be worse, worse off than me. So I tithe for my church. I continue to pay um, International Justice Mission, Rockside Ranch. Um, Monica, who's my housekeeper, she got a check. She doesn't have to come in. Um, whenever she can, I will keep sending that check every two weeks because that's what she was used to getting. And, um, and then Vista CrossFit. I pay my CrossFit gym because I'm afraid the doors won't be even open when I come back. Now, what it means is I don't spend money the same way I used to. I have opened a can of tuna many a time and um, I have learned to put sardines in a spaghetti mix and put it over pasta. All of us have ways that we on the other side can save money. Now this is um, Cora, she's my new dog. And the reason I, I, I brought it up is not only is she cute, but I wanna point out that sometimes the way we look on the outside isn't exactly the way we are on the inside. So that means that sometimes you're gonna look at people on the outside ring of your life and think that they've got it all made and everything is going really well for them. And they might not. In fact, they might just be a little bit like Cora. So Cora entered my life about four weeks ago when my daughter let me know that her neighbor had this dog and has had that dog for three years. So th Cora looks like a puppy and Cora looks like she's a well-fed, well-bred. And she is, except Cora came with a whole box of anxiety medications and lotions and all kinds of things that are supposed to help her calm down when really what had happened to Cora was she just not been taken care of. So Cora's all wet 
and uh, dirty and comes home when we need to take a bath, but she's a happy dog. We've not used any of those medications at this point in time because what she really just needed was attention. But on the outside, people think she's a puppy. She's three years old. People think she's kind of a spoiled purebred and she's still uh, working on training me. So the next part is taking some very specifics and helping you to change your mindset from I can't do it to maybe I can. Sometimes the most anxiety, and there's difference between anxiety and depression. Anxiety sometimes comes up at night. I had a client, a dentist, who um, had an afternoon that the schedule just uh, fell out. And that night he called me and said, I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. I'm not going to be able to sleep. And I made this suggestion. When that happens at night and you've got all of these voices going on in your head and worries, what you're really worried about is what happens next and what happens next, I want you to just feel the sheets of the bed that you're lying on. I want you to know that you have a roof over your head and that tomorrow you have your family that loves you. And I asked him to voice his worst fear and he said his worst fear is that he would someday live down by the river in a trailer, which is what happened to him when his dad's business failed. So sometimes anxiety will get the best of us. And the best thing we know is to be right now, this moment, right now, in this moment. All is well, all is well. So I use an app called 10% and it is a meditation app that allows me to um, pick up three minute meditation or a 15 minute meditation. But sometimes when I use it the most is at night, I can, if I have that problem with sleeping, uh, often happens when I'm traveling a lot for speaking, I'll use that app and it will take me through a 10 minute, be calm, go to sleep. Anyway, highly recommend it. Find ways all day long to say thank you. So science studies, show us again and again if you actually will write down what you're thankful for the more that you come up with every single day and you actually physically write them down the easier it will be for you to notice the sun is shining the shoes um, that are still in your closet and you'll want less be less envious less depressed if you're extremely grateful for what you have now i had the um honor and pleasure of traveling to Nairobi. I traveled there twice because we had sponsored three children at Africa Hope Center. And these were children who were um, orphans and they're orphans because their parents had died from AIDS. And this orphanage was founded because the church started seeing the members dying and the children were left. So um, these are children on the right hand side and so for two weeks I would go during the day spend time with them but I got to go back to my nice hotel right I didn't have to live with the reality of what they had there's a hundred children with little boxes and everything they own is in these boxes they sleep two to a bed two to a narrow bed and remember they're orphans so I went twice I've never been on a safari though I've been to Africa um, but it was a gift to me, an amazing, I got more out of it than they do because today when my schedule's pretty much empty and there's financial uncertainty, I always feel grateful for what I have. So this is a young man, his name is Nicholas. So off to the left-hand side, that's an article that was written about him and he looks pretty normal there on the left-hand side, except what? No arms and no legs. Now we might all say, oh, we know people uh, worse off than we are physically. But there's a little difference to this one. I worked out next to Nicholas. He is from San Diego and he was working out at downtown Invictus. And yep, I'm supposed to do a burpee. He's doing a burpee. I'm supposed to do a box jump. He's crawling over that box. He's the most outgoing positive person you will ever find. And he made sure to introduce himself to me. So what's your excuse, right? Navy SEALs. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what the Navy SEALs, uh, what are some of their strengths, right? So this is Josh Bridges. He competed at the uh, 
CrossFit Games with my daughter, Melissa. He did individual, she did team, but I got to see him work out multiple, multiple times. And in researching what were some of the um, guidelines that made Navy SEALs so strong is first and foremost, they said they are taught to think and live in the moment, right now, right then. The second one is they were always supposed to give themselves just positive thoughts. They were not allowed to say anything negative. They were to envision them doing something successfully. And um, last but not least, the, their belief was never count me out. Never count me out. So there are three poisons. If you have these in your life, they're going to work against you becoming resilient and getting back on the other side. And um, these three are, they start with a P. If you believe that this, you take this personally, if you take this personally, if you believe that some of this is your fault, I should have applied for that uh, loan money sooner. I uh, shouldn't have um, added that addition to the, the practice. Um, I shouldn't have taken on those managed care plans. So if you take it personally. The second one is if you believe it's pervasive, meaning not only am I a failure on paying my bills, but I'm a failure as a husband or I'm a failure in relationships. And the last one is if you think it's permanent. If you believe that these depressing times that are affecting your life are going to be permanent, any of those three beliefs will cripple you. So now what? Now we're back to the professional Dr. Wilts. Now, what are some of the suggestions that I have for them? You have other practice management consultants that um, Judy Kay, uh, Lois Banta, uh, Penny Reed, and they're gonna give you some more specifics. And I'm here to talk about resilience, but I will give you some, a mindset of some things I think are really important. So there's a lot of talk about teledentistry and I, uh, somebody asked me about it the other day and I said, I think we're only talking about it because we've got nothing else to do because we can't go in there and actually do dentistry. So here's how I think teledentistry will play out. Teledentistry works well if it's you connecting with your existing patients. Teledentistry works well if you have already put this and um, priced it so that you're getting paid for your time within an overall treatment. So you have a patient in ortho or, or sleep appliances or a larger case, and you don't need to have them come in all the time. You have worked that into a case fee. Do I think it's a good way to attract new patients? No, I personally don't. And um, I, of course, could be wrong. Something else that you've got to do between now and when you go back or when you sit down on that first day, you've got to have the talk. You've got to have the talk with the team in terms of what you're going to say to the patients in answer to their questions. And you have to come up with systems in terms of what questions you're going to ask them. You have got to be um, harmonious in your answers and your replies. I have a lot of respect for uh, Golden Proportions. It's a marketing company that I'm well aware of and often recommend sometimes to my clients. And they came out with a question list. And so uh, what they're doing well is not trying to tell you to market for new patients. They're understanding that you need to stay connected to the patients that you have. So they uh, posted a really good uh, list. So answering the COVID question, so you could access that. Other things that I'm suggesting, let go of what was or what could have been when it comes to dentistry. You're going to go back and practice dentistry, but it's not going to be the same. Not exactly the same. Doesn't mean it won't be better in some ways, but for a while, it's not going to be the same. And please don't go back to you have a business model in place that makes sense. That means you have to account for maybe a longer time uh, to turn your rooms around, longer time for people to uh, wear protective gear, longer time to explain to the patients what is taking place, depending on your state and what you adopt. I don't hear insurance carriers talking to us about they're gonna, how they're gonna increase our fees and coverage even though our costs are going to go up. So I hear a lot of energy and enthusiasm for getting back in the practice. My advice is make sure you know exactly what that's going to look like because just being back in business, unless you can pay the bills and be sustainable, 
doesn't make sense. Third one, check in with the team on their true desire to return. Many of them have childcare challenges that will take place. And until kids are back in school, there's a huge impact. Cherish every existing patient that you have who returns and stays in your practice. This is not the time to be marketing and looking for new people who initially cost you money in, in the comprehensive exam and don't have that same level of trust and confidence. Take care of the ones that you have and be as hungry and grateful as you were when you first started. Be as hungry and grateful as when you first started and make decisions when you're feeling strong, really strong. The young dentist down on the corner, Dr. Karen, she, um, she practices in a beautiful, beautiful practice in New York. So talk about a place that's been hard hit. But she is an inspiration to me. I met her at uh, Serona, or Syrac courses that she teaches. Um, she is a hard worker, takes amazing responsibility, has a beautiful family of three. And um, throughout her career, she has come up against stumbling blocks and challenges, whether it was the practice that she didn't expect to have, you know, didn't have the patients that she thought she was buying, um, but has always had a can-do positive attitude. So this is what all of us want to be telling ourselves right now. I know you're afraid, but you can handle this. I have a go-to mantra, and I've been saying it for 22 years, 23, 25 years. You got this, you got this, you got this. Because we wanna go back to doing what we love. We wanna go back to teaching other dentists how to make beautiful restorations, restoring people's smiles and leading our team. We wanna go back and we will go back. We wanna go back to leading that team in our area, providing the quality dentistry that we always have. But what it will take for you and your team to get to the other side is everybody absolutely has to recognize that you're in this together. If you pull apart and pick at one team member, it's like pulling apart and picking at your family. You are only going to be as strong individually as you are together as a team. I'm Janice Hurley and I normally am lecturing at dental conferences, whether it's the Chicago Midwinter or Hinman or doing um, thank you uh, for referral uh, seminars. I have a book uh, written about the new patient experience that was published uh, towards the end of last year. I work with dental offices one-on-one -on -one within their practice and particularly specialize in treatment presentation and the new patient experience. If you have any questions, there's my email address and I'd be glad to answer this for you. Thank you for your time. Janice, thank you very much. Uh, you know, really appreciate it. Uh, that, uh, was such a solid message. I, I just love your positive energy. Uh, you and your friends out there, Judy Kay and uh, Lois and Penny and, you know, fantastic, you know. Uh, and it's, it's nice to see how supportive you are of each other. So especially in these hard times, uh, love that. Uh, so thank you again. Have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, one is kind of uh, funny. Why only send the book to three or four kids? Do you have a black sheep? I'm not sure which books you're talking about. I don't know. I think they uh, thought you were sending your book to only, uh, I, I don't know where that came from exactly, but anyway. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Is there a difference between the first and second stages of denial? So the other thing that's interesting is that those stages of grief, those uh, well-known five stages of grief and grief, and now the sixth one from Harvard says that uh, it's acceptance, is that they um, don't go in order. So I used to think before I studied this that the first one was denial, um, and then the third one was anger, et cetera. And in reality, you can go up and down. And the hardest aspect of what we're facing, Timmy, right now 
is the uncertainty. So usually we know what we're up against and what we're facing and two things um, come to play. We know that there's a stop date. We know that this won't continue forever and we know it won't continue forever, but many of us don't have a start date when things will be business as usual. And then the second aspect that's really challenging, we don't have a resource um, in terms of who do we ask? So what's it like to be a dentist right after you've had a pandemic? Or what's it like to have um, furloughed my team and then tried to bring them back? So those two pieces can be really hard for us right now. It's the unknown and the uncertainty. Okay. Uh, what were the three poisons again? Yes, yes, yes. The three poisons are if you, it's pervasive, if you think it's pervasive, it's, it's in every area of my life. I, th this is not going well. So you start to see or think I'm not good with my kids. I wasn't good with my business, etc. The second one is personal. So if you take um, what's happening right now in any way personally, so my clients have reached out to me and some have let me know that they've got their, gotten their funding. Other of my clients have let me know that they were told they're not going to get the funding. Um, so another of my clients says his brother got the funding, but he didn't. So if you take it personally, if you take it personally that you didn't file in time or any aspect of this, then that is one of uh, the poisons. And the last one is if you think it's permanent. If you to yourself think, I'll never be as successful as I was before. I'll never um, be as happy as I was before. This current condition is permanent. So whenever we think something's permanent, that's a poison for moving forward. Remember I talked about the fact that one of the four concepts that Navy SEALs were trained and functioned on is that they have to picture themselves moving forward, doing something successfully. I want to tell you that um, if anybody ever comes across a photograph and if it's of a little girl with head kind of down moving through torrential rain, I'd love it if you'd send that to me. <laughs> because when I think of what it's like to move forward, both for me and some others, that's what it has often felt like. Just put your head down and put one foot in front of the other. All righty. Uh, Judy K uh, says, tell you, ta-da. Uh, oh. uh, she, <laughs> nice of her to join us. Thank uh, you. All righty. How do you feel, how do you deal when you don't feel like decisions are being made as a team? So I'm not sure if that's coming from a team member. I would assume so. Sure, sure. Rather than the dentist. So um, that often falls in the category of so, uh, something I have no control over. So everything goes into one of four quadrants. So if you don't feel like things are, um, decisions are being made as a team, you, uh, is that something I have control over? I don't have control over. So if in the past, let's say you're a team member, your doctor has not taken the whole team into consideration um, on certain decisions, then I'm not sure why I would think they would do differently now, right? I can't hope that people would be different. I have to look at their past behavior and believe them. And if I wanted it to be different, here's what I would have to ask myself. Did I go speak to the person that had the power to make that difference? So we're gonna just make up a situation within your practice. There's your, let's say you're the dental assistant and you don't feel that decisions are being made as to when to go back or how to schedule and you don't feel they're being made together as a team. If you want to make a difference, you have to go to the doctor who is the decision maker and be able to ask how they would like this approach and ask for what you want. What you can't do is talk to the other team members without talking to the doctor because otherwise, unfortunately, what we're doing with that energy is it's just an emotional release. It's venting. So everything, do I have control? or do I not have control? Please give grace and honor how much unbelievable stress your doctor, your business leader is at this time. And if you want something different, you've got to go to the person 
that has the power. Yeah, and I, I think you touched on that in your presentation. There is a lot of stress uh, with the PP uh, loans, the idle loans, the the grants and everything. And, uh, you know, it, it's just so dynamic. And, yeah, it's frustrating. And there's a lot of stress out there. So, uh, you know, thank you again for today's message. We, we appreciate it. So I'm going to try and paraphrase what I think the, the next person is asking here. Uh, but basically, what are we going to do when we get back into our offices and uh, similar to the AIDS uh, crisis, some of our patients aren't going to want to come in, some will want to come in. Uh, are, do you think we're going to be up to full speed when we get back? What is your take? So let's start first that and honor the fact that each of you is going to have a very different situation. So it starts with how long you've been in practice how loyal your patients are in terms of having been with you and how much contact did you keep with them along the way. So that means, if you think about it, you should have been emailing them probably weekly. You should have been posting on social media short videos or uh, photos of what your team members are doing. But every aspect of your communicating during this time should show empathy for the patient, empathy for the patient. So let me give you a quick example of something that I thought about as soon as you asked that, Jimmy. And it's that um, when this first happened, and I knew I was not going to have a paycheck for ages here on certain areas, then I contacted my credit card company and said, so can we, um, what can you do about this? I would like to make um, not the full payment like I normally do, but it was a very large uh, credit card balance because I have eight round trip flights on there plus some hotels for meetings or clients I was not going to actually be using. And the credit card company said, um, you can postpone a payment for a month, but we're still going to charge you the penalty and we're going to still charge you interest. So I said, okay, well, that's not going to work. So paid it off, but they had no interest at all in helping me. Now, I am bombarded with phone calls and emails from credit card companies saying, we'd love to have you zero point interest, you know, for the next four months. So it's not any different than asking the question about how loyal will our patients be? They will be as loyal to you as you have been to them. And you truly have to give them grace and honor that everybody's going to feel differently. So I'm of the belief system that you are, do not need to ramp up staff-wise because personnel is your most expensive overhead. You don't ramp up staff-wise for an onslaught or on poor of patients. And if you're a general practice that has hygiene, you've been extremely dependent. The success of your practice is dependent on keeping hygiene full. And hygiene may well be the aspect that's the slowest to come back, um, both from the patient's perspective and the hygienist. So, you don't know, we don't know. And the best gift that you could give to yourself is to be able to um, say and be at peace with, I don't know, because we don't, we truly don't. And to do everything we can to stay connected to the patients that we have. Um, hopefully you've, you've called on those patients that were in mid treatment. Hopefully you've called on all of your senior patients to make sure to find out how they are and their family is. You'll get back probably as much loyalty as you gave. Okay. Uh, what's the best way to have the, talk, the staff talk honestly about how they feel, i.e. safety and ready to return to work? You know, I would make use of a confidential survey monkey. So there's a uh, the ability to ask questions anonymously, 100% anonymously, so that they are returned and you don't get their email address. Um, I want people to be able to speak um, without worried about ramifications. Then I'm gonna look at that information. I'm gonna post it all up on a, a board or let print it out so people can see it. And then I'm going to say, let's talk about this. Um, you want, that understanding before you go back. And um, it's not going to be business as usual and finding out as soon as possible who wants to come back under the business model that you're able to construct would be really important. Okay. Do you have any sample emails for teledentistry announcements and education to patients via email? 
Uh, there's lots out there. Uh, just Google teledentistry and there's marketing companies as well as the teledentistry uh, software that um, would be able to give you. So ADA has guidelines in terms of what can be charged and um, so forth. So I'm not your, your best authority on that. I just think it's not the end all be all. You're going to have a be hard pressed to have patients pay you uh, what you deserve to be paid. Okay. Uh, any advice for start off the startup offices and patient loyalty aspects? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm so challenging that this is brand new and this, you had no idea this was going to happen to you, right? So you, of course, are as lean as you possibly can. You need to run your numbers to make sure that when you go back, it's going to make sense because your biggest overhead is personnel expenses. And then you have the uh, increased cost in uh, PPE. Um, every case is gonna be different, but I would not go back till financially I know that I've reached out to my patients so I can schedule something solid enough. And um, I do not believe they're going to go someplace else. If you'll reach out to the patients that you have, do a really good job. Let's say you had 150 patients. I'd rather you did a really good job with 150 that you had. And it doesn't mean offering deals. There's not enough markup in dentistry anymore to do a deal, yeah. um, but instead, be personable and honest and empathy. Everything is about empathy towards your patients. And then those 150 will feed you till you are at 200. Okay. Can you repeat the name of company for the confidential survey? Oh yeah, SurveyMonkey. SurveyMonkey, just Google SurveyMonkey and you can ask up to 10 questions without paying a fee and you can email them to your patients if they have an email within your practice or an email at home. And then you get the responses back and it doesn't identify who they came from. So they're actually uh, anonymous, absolutely anonymous. But when you design, sorry, point, that's uh, not good body <laughs> language. <laughs> when you design those questions, you there's just so there's 10. You want some of those that have a blank in there so they can give uh, a free thinking answer. Maybe the first couple on a scale of one to 10, how much are you looking forward to coming back? On a scale of one to 10, how worried are you about your patients being sick? Oh, you know, whatever the case might be. And then leave a box open to ask the specifics. What specifically are you the most worried about? And then let them fill that in. So the survey monkey will give you those responses. Yeah, thank you for those examples of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, from Lois Banta. Oh, my sweetheart. Uh, Janice, you are a rock goddess with so much helpful information. Oh, thank okay. you, my friend. Yeah, she's great. Uh, could you please repeat the link to Golden Proportions, uh, the handout answering COVID-10 frequently asked questions from patients? Uh, could I repeat it in what way repeat it? Um, uh, what, what is the link? Oh, well, go to Golden Proportions, okay. and, then, and then they have this great sheet called Answering COVID-19. Okay. Two pages, and um, Beautiful. I, I've been so impressed with them because they've just given away, given away, and um, that's, that's insight as to who they are anyway and how they function. Okay, uh, that we've covered pretty well all the questions, but I have, I'm gonna hit you with a pretty tough one here uh, from myself personally. Uh, I, you know, as the dentist, the owner, we're supposed to be the, the leader and uh, we're gonna go back in and uh, our staff is gathering information from all over the place. Yeah. And how are we gonna focus and get everybody on the same, in the same wagon, and you know, not pulling information from too many sources that you, you know will be counterproductive. Yes, that's a that's a great question, and it's on everyone's mind, and it needs to be addressed very uh, systematically. So here's the steps that I would do owning a dental practice right now. I am 
keeping up with information, but not making purchases or decisions based on fear, meaning it is changing constantly. So ADA supposedly gave us some sort of guidelines on going back when in reality, they're quite vague. And then there's others. Um, I belong to the American Academy of Systemic Health and I watched a, a webinar with several of those dentists. And one of them talked about not turning the rooms around except once every three hours. Well, that's never financially going to make any sense. So I start first with being very comfortable in knowing my team is going to read all kinds of information, knowing that as a dentist, you're a scientist pertaining, you understand the microbiology of this, you know the difference between an aerosol um, or, or a blood pathogen, the difference between a virus and a bacteria, you, you know that. So you're going to be okay with saying, I don't know about making decisions until we have something definitive. Definitive from OSHA as to how to protect ourselves and our staff, definitive from the CDC. Then I'm making sure that I bring in the team probably a week before I think that I'm going to uh, open to see patients. And I'm going to explain the science of what is taking place and how we're going to combat it. So I love some of the uh, literature coming out about uh, air purification. I love some of the um, new aspects that we have available to us um, in terms of controlling aerosols with our hygienists and their work. But I'm gonna feel comfortable about saying I don't know. And when I do go back, I will have firmly decided how I'm going to run my business because they need confidence and consistency from you, absolutely being empathetic. And the reason I'm doing it a week before, I want people to have time to adjust and to make sure that everybody knows it is it's their choice to come back or not to come back. So I'm a microbiology major. I love it, this stuff, I eat it up. But what I don't like is the um, sensationalism and the unrealistic expectations. Um, we're a business, and unless dentists can stay in business, um, none of this is going to help the team. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, this is nice. Uh, Deborah Englehart uh, Nash, is, oh. she's uh, our speaker tomorrow. Oh, so, she's a rock star. She says, Janice, your information is not only inspirational, it's practical. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. So fantastic. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Oh, uh, here's one more question that came in. And uh, do you recommend after we go back to practicing that we keep our office hours and staff hours as full time? Also, how to avoid and deal with last minute cancellations? Well, <laughs> okay, so let's let's take the first one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and do we all wish we had a dollar for every time someone asks uh, last minute cancellations? Okay, yeah. so let's let's take the first one. I am um, looking at my business model. I'm checking to see how full I can keep my schedule. So I start first with the business model of, of um, when is it financially, what financially, where am I get, going to be on all the costs and when can I buy what's needed to equip the office? And I'm really finding out from the team who's gonna come back and when, when they're not. And then I schedule accordingly. So you're going to schedule based on supply and demand, you're not going to schedule a certain way because it has always been that way. So yes, your patients might've been used to certain things, but you hopefully with great empathy have been communicating to your patients and they know that everything is not the same. So if you have new hours, new ways of uh, bringing them in, then they're going to listen to that. So it's a business. I'm gonna construct the hours that I think I have the patient demand for. All right, so let, let, and then let's go to the second one. Um, how do you avoid cancellations? So first and foremost, you are going to be as vulnerable as the number of times you've ever canceled on them. If you've canceled on them, you have a patient base that is more likely to cancel on you. You are going to reduce your risk every for every patient that you actually phone called, not just used your uh, patient communication software, you actually spoke. So I'm gonna speak to all of my patients for the next two weeks and start first with empathetically asking how they are and their family is, and I'm going to check to see um, where they're at with coming in for their appointment and if they have 
any concerns. But I will have had to have trained my team first on the top 10 questions that patients might have because we have mm -hmm. to consistently answer that. I'm not ready to go back in and see patients. I'm not ready to jump back in because it's business as usual and I don't have a cash flow. I think there's a lot to do so that when we do it, we go back in and we do it right. Well, thank you very much again for okay, your sir. kind donation of your time, your expertise. Uh, for everyone that's in the webinar here, we're just going to put up uh, my PowerPoint presentation again with the upcoming webinars. Uh, so if you, uh, okay, you stop sharing your screen, I'm going to throw up that uh, PowerPoint. Okay. So, and uh, it'll just take me a minute to do that. And again, thank you. And we look forward to getting you out this way sometime. That'd be uh, lovely. Uh, sooner the better, I hope. Or, <laughs> uh, so thank you again for such a positive message. All righty. For those of you that uh, attended today's webinar, you'll receive CE credit in the next couple of days. That CE credit will be coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. Uh, Upcoming webinars tomorrow include uh, uh, Deborah Engelhart uh, Nash, and looking forward to her joining us. Uh, for you AGD members, we will send your credits to the AGD on your behalf. Uh, on Monday, uh, Dr. Ross Nash is going to be presenting on indirect aesthetic dentistry, so that'll be a, a good one. Terry Harris, for those of you from Washington State, you know him really well from Harris Biomedical. He's going to be going over on Tuesday, return, returning to work a checklist. Penny Reed is joining us next Tuesday as well. So uh, just a great lineup of speakers for both uh, assistants, hygienists, staff members, uh, dentists, you name it. Uh, Dr. Melkers will be uh, taking us down the path of occlusion. Dr. Yasin is continuing his implant study club. Uh, Dr. Catafucci is going to be his guest next Wednesday. That'll be a good one. Dr. Catafucci does gorgeous burial work. Uh, we're working on um, our Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics Card P Day. That's going to be Thursday, May 7th. We've got our speakers lined up. Thank you again to the Seattle King County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, Patterson, Comet USA, Arkansas AGD for pushing out these webinars to uh, their constituents. Uh, we've got lots of webinars coming up. If you need to register or want to register for those, go to www.washingtonagd.org. You can use the QR codes. Thanks again to our speaker, Dr. Starsevic, uh, yesterday from the Croatian Academy of Aesthetic Dental Medicine. Great presentation. Hey, if you're not an AGD member, think about becoming an AGD member, especially you young dentists out there. First year of membership is only $78. It's great value. If you've missed any of these webinars or you would like to share these webinars with your dentist, your team members, uh, a colleague, go to YouTube and Washington Academy of General Dentistry and you'll be able to see those webinars for a period of time. I want to remind you at 2.30 today, we've got Dr. Tazir Suleiman coming uh, to speak with us regarding bleaching, 30 years, a retrospective, looking at the scientific evidence uh, behind bleaching and really uh, a, an approach from an academic. So looking forward to that. Um, Again, Janice Hurley, we appreciate you uh, spending time with us. And with that, I just want to say on behalf of the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, the Stay Home and Stay Healthy CE webinars, thank you. We appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you later today. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Dr. Hess. Thank you, Janice.